Hi, everyone. We sure do live in interesting times, don't we? We're moving to the future faster and faster. I don't know how much you think about it. I think in this crowd, probably a lot. I'm kind of hardwired to look a few years into the future, and I find it so exciting, but often a little lonely. I've been really fortunate to get plugged into a group called Singularity University, which is a whole bunch of people that just look into the future and all the exponential changes that are taking us there, all the different technologies. I believe we're living in absolutely revolutionary times. We see it every day with our computers, with the way we're connecting. A lot of this has been powered by Moore's Law. You know, all of our computing technologies, which we take for granted today, but 40 years ago, you know, they were pretty crude. We have the power of supercomputers in our pockets and infinite computing on the back end, the cloud. And it just keeps growing and growing, and we're pushing our manufacturing capabilities to the very limits to keep growing this technology. But it's not just a technological revolution. We're starting to see a social revolution in things like Wikipedia, Facebook, which is now the third largest community under one flag, and if they make a deal with China, the largest, which is pretty remarkable. I'm waiting for them to issue passports. <laughs> Twitter, which is really the neural feed of, of millions of people in real time. And it's changing the way we look at media and the way we look at each other. A handful of renegades can peel literally the veil of control off some of the largest systems in the world. This is remarkable stuff. And it's actually creating real revolutions on the ground. And there's going to be more because a bigger revolution is coming, one that you probably haven't even seen coming yet. And it's because of DNA. DNA is the most incredible molecule. It is literally reach into every living thing, small or large. It is the programming language of life. And like all languages, we have to master the basics, reading, writing, and comprehension. The reading of DNA, the which we call sequencing, has been moving ahead so incredibly fast the last few years that it is making Moore's Law look pokey. It's remarkable. We're sequencing genomes at a cost that it's more expensive to store the data on disk than to read the DNA. Comprehension has moved far beyond the individual researcher. This is a digital biology that is expanding so quickly that it's really going to take Watson-type computing to generate understanding and take us forward. But it's writing DNA that's the most creative. You can't write from the top on down. You have to start bottom up. 20 years ago, when I was in the lab, this is what it looked like. It's a complicated kitchen. It really is. It's a complicated kitchen. And the way we edited DNA was using cut and paste techniques, kind of ransom note style. It was so difficult that we could only add a trait or two to some of the largest crops in the world and the most important ones. And with drugs, we could only make the smallest drugs, single proteins, small ones. There's been a revolution coming, though, because we can now print DNA in an automatic way. Literally using chemical synthesis, you can email a file, this is the DNA sequence I want, and companies will print it on their machines and mail it back to you. And the cost per base of doing this, per base pair, per bit, per letter, if that's the way you think, is falling exponentially at the same rate as sequencing, just a few years in the future. In 2002, we booted up the first synthetic virus. They self-assemble, so it's pretty easy. We were starting to make synthetic bacteria. We're already playing and re-engineering simple photosynthetic organisms like algae to make fuels and other things, and yeast is becoming our platform of choice because it's the foundation of bread and beer. <laughs> beer. 
I expect in the very near future, you'll see some people come in from the top down and say, it's time for another human genome project. We read the human genome, but that was 20 years ago. Let's write a human scale genome. I'm not saying make synthetic humans. I'm saying be able to create six billion base pairs and organize it into chromosomes. I expect you'll see that project launch soon so that we can get more activity in this area and build up our tools and technologies globally. We're making a whole new tree of life with these technologies. And there's nothing that we can't reach. There are millions of organisms that nature has created, billions of microorganisms, and of course, we're just standing in the present. We don't see all the ones that came before us. And we certainly don't know the constraints of what our intentions can make. This field is moving so quickly that education hasn't been able to keep up. Literally, how many genetic engineers do you know? The only way you can learn it is by doing it. I've been involved with programs like iGEM, International Genetically Engineered Machines. It's a terrible name, a long one. But what they do is incredible. They've open sourced genetic engineering and the training thereof. Around the world, there are students that are doing things like making glowy bacteria and projects that will blow your mind if you review them because they are so creative. They're writing new software tools that make this field more accessible. They come up on stage, sometimes very well dressed. This group got a clothing sponsor to present their work. <laughs> they go out and raise most of their money privately because there are no grants, not many grants, there's more. There was nothing at the start that would support this work. They show their team spirit, their school colors, they love it. And then they gather for a group photo. This is 2009, I believe. And we, last year we had, how many? There was over 120 teams from 26 countries. We're up over 150 different teams this year, thousands of students going through, and an alumni that's approaching 10,000. And it's moving below the cellular architecture into biomolecular with a learning by doing competition that's starting up this year, which is molecular design on computers translated to the nanoscale. These are genomes that have been folded on computer software and then realized in physical life. And I love the happy face and it's getting more and more complicated. We are building cellular machines and molecular machines. The students are doing it from the ground up. There's a whole culture of biohackers, and that shouldn't scare you. All scientists are hackers. There's a whole culture of biohackers that are emerging. They're coming in under the banner of DIY Bio, and they're global. These are basically hacker clubs around the world. They've proliferated like crazy the first community lab space opened up in New York City this last December with an advisory board, professional equipment, and a training and membership model for funding. There's going to be more of these. Think Genspace X. This is biotech in a box, and it's opening biotech to entirely new communities where they come in and learn. So now we're getting crossovers to law, to physics, to engineering. And there's a passion in this community you don't find very often among scientists. <laughs> Computer programming came up from the bottom. It was always the kids. People forget that. But I really want to underscore, this is a world-changing technology. It's not a toy. And so we have to be careful how we apply it. Last year, Craig Venter, made a synthetic genome, the first operating system, and booted it up in a bacterium. It's not a big bacterium, it doesn't do anything special, but it literally marked the first time in four billion years that a microbe evolved to a, more, to a higher organism that can make another microbe. That's pretty cool. It caught the eye of the president, and he said, oh, he finally did it. I can't ignore it anymore and commissioned 
a report, a study on this technology and said, get back to me in six months. It's moving so fast. And they did. It was published in December. It's an amazing report. And basically, they said, yes, we have to keep moving this forward because this is the new programming industry. Really, America doesn't want to fall behind in this. China is already at the forefront, but it's not just China and America. It's every country in the world has access to this technology. Cancer will be at the forefront of this technology because cancer is low-hanging fruit. We're not trying to fix a cell. We're just trying to kill it selectively. We're seeing open-source cancer movements like Stephen Friend's Sage Bionetworks. These are amazing new repositories of information. The students at iGEM last year, a group from, from Freiburg, Germany, open-sourced viral cancer therapies, actually gene therapies. You can make almost anything with it. How do we bring this to people? I don't know yet, but I want to find out, which is why I created a cooperative biotech company. Member-owned, it's basically a virtual pharma, it's basically a bank. Because people join and that gives us funding, and then we go out and say, we want to find ways to bring this to people. How do we do it? Who's going to sue us? What barriers do we have to cross? We're only a year and a half old, but we're learning some really interesting things. We need a global perspective on this because, trust me, if you can make a selective cancer therapy, be able to make something that selectively kills an individual cell that is identified as damaged, that's the most potent biological weapon in the world because you can train that to go after healthy tissue too. So this is not a toy, but you can't have positive without the risk of negative. So the question is, how do we do it right? I trust kids. I trust people with good intentions, and I trust transparency, and that's why I support open-source synthetic biology and have championed it since I first heard about it. In some ways, we are a cancer on the world. We know it. We pave it over, we put up buildings, we know it's not sustainable. Our chemical and industrial processes are pushing the world to the brink. This is a living world. And this technology allows us to reach into that living world to make chemical processes biochemical, which is remarkable, to grow amazing new things, to create organisms that serve us. We have the chance to remedy some of the mistakes we've made, to clean up our water, to make plastics and materials that decompose, to make energy in new ways, to clean up the air, and to make our cities green again. These are industrial landscapes, and I don't know what the bio-industrial landscapes look like, but we're going to find out, and we're going to find out fast, because this is a technology that is truly moving at the p faster than Moore's Law. And it will create economies around the world, new industries bigger than Google, because life is more important than your computers. I don't know what that world looks like, but I am an optimist. And I know by keeping things open, by sharing, and by recognizing the talent of the young, and boy, we need to support these people. The scientists that are at the forefront of this field are not they're, they're young. They're under 25. In the comic, they made me the green arrow. I really want to see green. I want to see green come to our cities. I want a green world. I want a safe world. Not one with bioweapons. Not one with things that scare us. But I am an optimist. And I know that there are people that will try to abuse this. Let's stay on top of it. If you're the type that reads and wants to catch up on this type of thing, my friend Rob Carlson wrote a wonderful book called Biology is Technology, which chronicles how this field got going. And if you're a little more philosophical, you may want to check out Kevin Kelly's What Technology Wants. And with that, I'll just say the future is here. We just need to make sure everyone gets access to it. Thank you.